Welcome to the University of Toronto Advanced Undergraduate Physics Lab Quick Start video on how to use a lock-in amplifier. We will start with a quick theoretical introduction, and then do a couple of hands-on exercises to help you learn the basics of using a lock-in. The second exercise can also be used to test whether your lock-in is actually working in a typical experiment. A lock-in amplifier is a sensitive AC voltmeter that measures the amplitude and phase of the Fourier component of an input signal relative to a reference sinusoidal signal. It can take tiny signals out of noise and make measurements that are otherwise almost impossible to do. It does this by multiplying together the signal and reference voltages and then averaging the result. The analog or digital electronics needed to do this are complex, but the basic underlying math is easy to understand. Consider a time-varying sinusoidal signal with arbitrary amplitude, frequency, and phase. The amplitude is just half the peak-to-peak -peak voltage, and the phase is measured relative to an arbitrary reference voltage that is zero phase by definition. We are interested in the product of these two voltages, and from your high school trigonometry, you may remember that the product of two sines can be written as the sum and difference of two cosines. Using this, the product of the signal and reference voltages can be written as the sum of two terms whose frequencies are the sum and difference of the signal and reference voltage frequencies. A lock-in amplifier averages this product over some time interval, and as we all know, the average of any cosine over many cycles is zero. So the long-term average of the first term will always be zero. The long-term average of the second term will also be zero, and this is where the magic happens, unless the signal and reference frequencies are the same, in which case the average of this term just reduces to the cosine of the phase difference between the signal and reference. The lock-in normalizes this average and outputs a DC voltage equal to the root mean square amplitude of the signal times the cosine of the phase. So that's the math. Let's now see what a lock-in actually does. Your lock-in may look different from this one and have more features, but it should have the same basic capabilities. For our first exercise, we'll use two different sinusoidal voltages from two different frequency generators, one for the reference and one for the signal. We'll split both frequency generator outputs so we can see them simultaneously on both the lock-in amplifier and on an oscilloscope. The reference voltage is the top trace on the oscilloscope and the signal is the bottom. We will set the reference and signal both to 100 Hz and 100 millivolt peak-to-peak -peak amplitudes. We are triggering on the reference voltage on top and the absence of any drift on the bottom shows us that the two frequency generators are well calibrated. I'll tweak the signal frequency a bit so it starts to drift relative to the reference. Now we turn on the lock-in amplifier. This gauge shows the size of the DC output signal, and you can see the needle flipping back and forth as the cosine of the phase difference varies. I'll adjust the sensitivity to keep the needle from going off scale. The sensitivity setting corresponds to full scale on the needle or full voltage on the output. We now have a signal that has almost, but not quite, the same frequency as the reference, so its phase drifts slowly on the oscilloscope. Comparing the needle with the oscilloscope, we see that on this lock-in, the needle is at its maximum value when the two traces are either exactly in phase or 180 degrees out of phase. This light tells you whether the cosine of the phase difference is positive or negative, so you can tell whether the maximum corresponds to a phase of zero or 180 degrees. We can adjust the relative phase of the signal and reference using these knobs and buttons. We normally adjust the phase until the output is a maximum, and if we want to know what the relative phase is, we can read it from the phase knob and button positions. From the oscilloscope, we can see that the reference and signal are currently about 180 degrees out of phase, and as we expect, the lock-in gauge shows a maximum and the negative phase light is on. If we press the 180 degree button, the needle is still at a maximum, but the positive phase light has now come on. If we tweak the signal frequency a bit, we can shift its phase by about 90 degrees and then stop the drift by going back to 100 Hz. The output gauge is now zero as expected since the cosine of 90 degrees is zero. If we press the 90 degree button, the gauge goes to a maximum with the negative light on, since looking at the scope, we see that we are actually at negative 90 degrees, or equivalently positive 270 degrees. The phase knob allows us to make fine adjustments to the phase, so any phase between 0 and 360 degrees can be reached. This lock-in also has an auto phase button, which when pressed, automatically tries to adjust the phase to achieve maximum output amplitude. This can be very helpful, but I usually I check it manually. And note, however, that the auto phase can't track the phase if it varies too quickly. To determine the output signal value more precisely, we normally read the output with a data acquisition device connected to a computer, but for this exercise we'll just look at the output with a digital voltmeter. Plugging in the voltmeter, you can see the voltage oscillating up and down. Since this voltage is proportional to the cosine of the phase, it goes both negative and positive as the signal and reference go in and out of phase. If I adjust the amplitude of the signal, the output voltage increases or decreases proportionately. Changing the amplitude of the reference has no effect on the output unless it becomes large enough to damage the lock-in or small enough that the lock-in can't reliably lock onto it. For example, if I unplug the reference, the unlock light turns on and the output becomes undefined with the plus and minus phase lights flashing. 
if I adjust the signal away from the reference frequency, the output goes to zero. Here the signal is twice the reference, and the output is zero. Lock-ins usually have a 2F switch that allows you to measure the amplitude and phase of signals that have twice the frequency of the reference. Pressing the 2F switch, the output is non-zero. We don't use this feature much in the advanced lab right now, but there are some situations where it is very useful, so it is worth being aware that it exists. Another thing to check is whether the lock-in signal input is grounded or floating. If the signal is already grounded elsewhere, you probably want the lock-in input floating to avoid ground loops, which is how we have it set. If you don't see a switch, it is probably set internally. The less important setting we'll talk about is the time constant. A lock-in has a low-pass filter, whose bandwidth is 1 over the time constant setting. A long time constant reduces the noise on the output, which is good, but if the signal changes, it will take several time constants for the lock-in output to move to its new value. A long time constant is good for precise measurement of a steady function, but shorter time constants are needed when the signal is varying quickly. For our second exercise, we'll show how the lock-in can measure tiny signals in the presence of noise. This exercise is also an easy way to test and calibrate a lock-in. We want to see how the lock-in measures tiny signals in a noisy background, so we need a known tiny signal. One way to do this is to put the output from a signal generator across a big resistance and a small variable resistance in series. The lock-in will measure the voltage drop across the small resistance, and the amplitude of the voltage drop is easily determined from the lock-in output amplitude and the resistance values, which are easily measured with an oscilloscope and an ohmmeter. We'll use this switched resistance box, which already has a 1 mega ohm individual component resistor between the black terminal and its unconnected third terminal. The 1 mega ohm resistor is our big resistance, and the box provides our small variable resistance that can vary from 10 kilo ohms down to 1 ohm between its red and black terminals. Using two function generators allowed us to demonstrate some of the features of the lock-in, but in a typical experiment you only need one, because the same frequency generator provides both the reference and also drives the signal, which is what we'll do now. We'll move the signal so it comes from the same function generator as the reference. This requires rearranging the cabling and adding various connectors and wires. You'll figure it out. The function generator output goes across both resistors. Be careful that the ground is attached to the small resistance end. Otherwise, there will be no way to reattach the oscilloscope signal connections without shorting out either the function generator or the signal to ground. I am being a bit cavalier about the cabling here, which may come back to haunt us later, but for now we'll charge ahead. There, our last connection attaches the signal input for the lock-in across the small resistance. But the signal on the oscilloscope just looks like noise, and that is because it is noise. To check that everything is connected correctly, we crank up the function generator amplitude. The reference goes through the roof on the oscilloscope, and we can now see a signal on both the oscilloscope and on the lock-in. The function generator amplitude is now about 20 volts peak-to-peak. -peak. The resistance box is currently set to 10 kilo ohms, so the signal peak-to-peak -peak voltage across the red and black terminal should be about 200 millivolts, which is what we see on the scope. The lock-in agrees, showing about 70 millivolts RMS, which corresponds to about 200 millivolts peak-to-peak. We now start turning down the function generator amplitude, and the signal shrinks until it disappears on the oscilloscope, swamped by noise. With the function generator amplitude at 200 millivolts peak to peak, and the resistance box still at 10 kilo ohms, we expect the signal to be about 2 millivolts, which is swamped on the oscilloscope by the typical several millivolts of electrical noise. The lock-in also shows almost nothing, which is expected since it is currently on 100 millivolt sensitivity. So, 1 millivolt would be less than 1% of full scale. If, however, we switch the lock-in sensitivity to 1 millivolt, we see a clear signal corresponding to about 0.7 millivolts RMS, as expected. So already the lock-in is measuring a sinusoidal signal that is invisible in noise on the oscilloscope. I now start reducing the resistance of the box in 1 kilo ohm steps, and we see the signal amplitude dropping on the lock-in. Now we are down to 1 kilo ohm, and the signal on the lock-in is about 70 microvolts as expected, so we can switch the lock-in to 100 microvolts sensitivity. Changing from 1 kilo ohm on the kilo ohm switch to 1,000 ohms on the 100 ohm switch, we continue on down in 100 ohm steps. At 200 ohms, we pause and switch the lock-in sensitivity to 10 microvolts, since we expect the signal to be only 7 microvolts root mean square at the next step of 100 ohms. But when we get to 100 ohms, things look weird. The lock-in still seems to be seeing a signal, but the phase is suddenly switched to negative, and the lock-in output doesn't correspond to the expected 7 microvolts. And if I shift the phase by 180 degrees, the output amplitude is not symmetric. What is going on? It could be that this lock-in doesn't work on the 10 microvolt scale, but before jumping to that conclusion, let's back up a bit. Looking at our original sketch of this test and calibration circuit, we see that it is missing some things. First, there is an oscilloscope across the small resistance, and this oscilloscope is grounded. Second, the function generator is also grounded. So there is a ground loop, 
This ground loop is like a big antenna picking up noise, which will appear in our circuit if the wires have any resistance, which they certainly do. We are making very sensitive measurements, so even a small resistance can produce a noise voltage in our circuit that will affect our signal. The oscilloscope isn't doing anything useful now, since the signal is too small to be seen by it, so let's remove it from the circuit. We need to disconnect both the reference and signal oscilloscope cables, since both are grounded. Et voila! We now see 7 microvolts on the lock-in, as expected, and the output is symmetric when we switch the phase by 180 degrees. Everything looks good, so it appears that the ground loop was the problem. Let's switch to 100 ohms on the 10 ohm switch and keep on stepping down. When we get down to 10 ohms, we see that the lock-in output level is almost 9 microvolts, which is larger than our expected 7 microvolts. We did all this quite quickly, however, so the results are a bit rough. To calibrate the lock-in, we really should plot the lock-in output voltages versus the values calculated from the known function generator voltage and the big and small resistance values. The resistance values of the box and all the wiring should also be checked with an ohmmeter. I'll keep on going down to 1 ohm on the box, so you have more data if you want to make the plot yourself. It appears there might be a small extra resistance in the wiring of this setup, or zero offset in the lock-in itself, but otherwise this lock-in seems to be doing its job pretty well. So, that's our introduction to lock-in amplifiers. They are great instruments. Have fun using them.